Everyone, take heed. A calm voice spoke into everyone's ears. The prey has entered the cage. The speaker was a man. He had no distinguishing features, and he would not stand out in a crowd. However, there was no emotion in his seemingly man-made black sclerae, or the scar on his face. Offer up your faith to the gods! Everyone began their silent prayers, a shortened version of their usual praise to their gods. They had to spend time in prayer even when operating in another country. This was not complacency on their part, but a symbol of their faith in their gods. These men, who offered everything to the slain theocracy and the gods they revered, were far more devout than the average citizen of the theocracy. This was why they could perform cruel acts without the slightest bit of hesitation, and why they felt no guilt for doing so. After their prayers, the eyes of every man present were as hard and cold as glass. Begin! With that one single word, they neatly encircled the village in a way that would appear to onlookers as the product of long, hard training. These men were a black ops group from the slain theocracy. Though their reputation spread far and wide, little was known about their members. They belonged to one of the six scriptures who answered directly to the high priests of the slain theocracy. They were the Sunlight Scripture, whose mission was to exterminate demi-human settlements. However, there were very few of these men, who were the most involved of the six scriptures in combat. There were only around a hundred of them in total. This was because the recruitment standards for the Sunlight Scripture were very strict. Entry required the ability to cast third tier divine magic, which was also the highest tier of magic that ordinary magic casters could reach. In addition, prospective recruits had to be in excellent physical condition, and they had to possess a strong will and deep faith. In other words, they were the elite among other elite combatants. The man quietly sighed as he watched his men disperse. Once they scattered to take their positions, it would be very hard to be sure of their movements. However, he was not worried about their skillful encirclement of the village. The Sunlight Scripture's commander, Nigun Grid Luin, only felt the peace of mind that came with knowing that success was at hand. The Sunlight Scripture was not used to long-term clandestine operations in the field. As a result, they had missed four chances to finish the mission in the past. They were exceedingly careful every time they closed in on Gazif and his men of the kingdom, in order to avoid being spotted. If they missed this chance as well, these days of tracking and pursuing would drag on and on. Next time, I'd like to ask the other teams for help, and leave some of the work to them. The speaker was one of the men who had stayed behind to protect Nigun. Damn right! We've always been specialized in extermination, after all. I mean, this is a strange mission. Usually, we would have backup from the Windflower Scripture for something as important as this. Indeed. I do not know why they only deployed us this time around. Still, this will be a good experience for us all. We can take this as training in infiltrating enemy territory. Hmm. For all we know... That was what the people on top intended. Negan said that, but he was very clear that another mission of this nature would be very unlikely. The orders he had been given were to assassinate the greatest warrior of the kingdom, the man famed in the surrounding countries for his matchless might, Gazif Stronoff. This was not the sort of task which would usually be assigned to the Sunlight Scripture. Instead, it would have been the province of the Theocracy's most powerful special operations unit, the Black Scripture, whose members wielded the power of heroes. However, it was not possible this time round. The reason was top secret, so he could not tell his subordinates. But Negan knew the truth. The Black Scripture was protecting the Holy Relic, Kei Sekikuko, 
in preparation against the resurrection of the catastrophe Dragon Lord. While the Windflower scripture was busy chasing the traitor, who had made off with a relic of the Miko princesses, neither of them had the free time to help them. Negun unconsciously felt a scar on his cheek. He remembered the only time in the past where he had been forced to flee with his tail between his legs. The face of that girl with the jet black demonic sword rose in his mind. Magic could have easily healed the wound without leaving a mark, but he had purposely left the scar to engrave the lesson of that humiliating defeat into his heart. That damnable Blue Rose. The members of Blue Rose were citizens of the kingdom, just like Gazif. Their priestess was the one who most drew his ire. Besides the fact that she was an infidel who worshipped another god, she had stopped Nigun while he was planning to attack demi-humans, and even believed that she was on the side of justice in doing so. Humanity's weak, and it uses any and all means to defend itself. Anyone who doesn't know that is an utter and complete fool. One of the subordinates seemed to have sensed the anger smoldering in Nigun's glassy black eyes and interjected. B but the kingdom is foolish too. Nigun did not answer, although he agreed with those words. Gazef was very strong, so in order to weaken him, they had to deprive him of his panoply. The kingdom was divided into the noble and the royal factions. Since they were opposed to Gazef, a prominent figure in the royal faction, the Noble Faction was easily led to take political action to eliminate him. They didn't even pause to consider that the impetus for their deeds came from a foreign power. Gazif was a commoner who had risen to his current station by dint of his swordplay, and so the nobles despised him. And that had led to this conclusion. The kingdom's trump card would soon be lost by their own hands. That was a supremely foolish move to Nigun. They, the slain theocracy, might be divided into six sects, but whenever they needed to act, they did so as one. One reason for that was because everyone respected each other's gods. The other was because everyone knew that there were many inhuman tribes and monsters in this world, and that they would be in danger if they did not work together. Which is why everyone should walk the path of the righteous teachings. Together! Humanity should not fight amongst itself, but work hand in hand to bring about a better and brighter future! Gazif would be the sacrifice for that. Sir, can we kill him? Nigun did not mock his subordinates' unease. Their prey was the kingdom's warrior captain, the strongest man in the region. Gazif Stronoff. Eliminating him would be more difficult than attacking and exterminating the inhabitants of a huge goblin village. In order to dispel his underling's fears, Negun calmly replied, It will be fine, my brothers. Right now, he does not possess any of the kingdom's treasures, the ones which he is permitted to bear. Without them, killing him will be a piece of cake. No, no. It would be better to say that without them, this is our one and only chance to kill him! The kingdom's warrior captain, Gazif Stronoff, was famed as the strongest fighter in the land, but there was a reason for that reputation beyond his extraordinary swordsmanship. The reason was the five heirlooms of the kingdom. Although only four of them were known, he was permitted to bear all of them. The gauntlets of vitality that made their user immune to fatigue, the Amulet of Immortality, which constantly regenerated his wounds. The Guardian Armor, made of adamantite and enchanted to ward off critical hits. Razor's Edge, the sword created and enchanted in pursuit of sharpness, which could slice through armor like the proverbial hot knife through butter. Even Negun could not hope to triumph in a head-on attack against Gazef Stronov, whose offensive and defensive ability increased astronomically when he used those items. No, it might well be that no human could defeat him when he was like that. However, he did not have those treasures with him now, so this was a great chance for Nigun. Nigun patted his chest lightly. In this world, 
There were three types of magic items which fell outside the usual types and classifications. The first kind were the relics from 500 years ago, left behind by the eight greed kings, who had conquered the world in an instant. The next kind came from the dragons, who were once the masters of the world before they were decimated by the eight greed kings. The most powerful dragons, the dragon lords, made the secret treasures of dragon kind, and the third kind were the keystones of the slain theocracy, the artifacts left behind from when the six gods descended upon the world 600 years ago. Those were the three types. What Nigun had in his breast pocket now was a rare treasure that very few people in the slain theocracy possessed. In other words, it was Nigun's secret weapon. Nigun glanced at the metal band on his wrist. Numbers floated up from its surface, indicating that the appointed time had come. Begin the operation. Nigun and his subordinates began casting spells. They summoned the highest ranking angels their magic would permit. I see. So there were people out there. Gazif peeked out at the people surrounding the village from inside the darkened house. He could see three people within his field of vision. They were slowly advancing on the village, while maintaining an even separation from each other. They were unarmed, and were not wearing heavy armor. However, that did not mean that they were pushovers. Many magic casters disliked such equipment, and preferred lighter gear. This suggested that they were magic casters. However, it was the winged monsters floating beside them which confirmed their vocations. Angels. Angels were monsters summoned from another world, and many people, particularly the citizens of the slain theocracy, believed them to be messengers of the gods. However, the priests of the kingdom ruled that these so-called angels were merely summoned monsters. While these religious disputes were part of the reason why the countries were set against each other, Gaza felt that their status as divine messengers was secondary to their strength as monsters. To Gazif, angels and demons, their similarly ranked counterparts, were stronger than many other monsters summoned using magic of a similar tier. Most of them had special abilities, and some could even use magic. They were troublesome foes, in his reckoning. Of course, that depended on the individual angel. Not all of them were difficult to beat. However, the angels this time round, with their shining breastplates, and flaming swords were of a type that was unknown to him. Ainz was watching them with him from the side. He asked Gazif, who did not know anything and could not gauge their strength. Who are these people? What do they want? I don't think there should be anything that valuable in this village. Master Gone, you do not know them either? Well, if it's not wealth they seek, then there can be only one other answer. Ainz and Gazif locked eyes. They must really hate you, warrior captain. It comes with the job of warrior captain. However, this is troubling. Judging by the way the other side has so many people who can summon angels, they must be from the slain theocracy. And it's clear that the people carrying out this operation must be a special operations unit, the legendary six scriptures. It would seem that both in number or ability, the opposition is superior to us. Gazef shrugged, indicating the difficulty he was in. He might have seemed merely depressed on the surface, but inside, he was seething with anger and panic. Well, they've certainly gone through a lot of trouble using the noble faction to strip me of my gear. However, it's troublesome for that snake of a man to remain in the courts so I guess it should be my good fortune to be able to recognize his villainy here. Still, I didn't expect the slain theocracy to have their eyes on me. He snorted. He did not have enough men. He was under-equipped for a battle like this, and he had no plan in mind. In short, he had nothing. Although there might still be a trump card he could use. Is that an Archangel Flame? It looks similar enough, but... What's a monster like that doing here? 
Could it have been summoned by magic too? That means... Gazif turned to look at the mumbling eyes. With a hopeful look on his face, he asked, Master Gon, if it's alright with you, would you be willing to let me hire you? There was no answer, but Gazif could feel the weight of Ainz's gaze beneath the mask. You may name your price and I will meet it. Please permit me to refuse. Even the loan of that knight you summoned would be fine. I must refuse that as well. I see. Then, what if I conscripted you in accordance with the kingdom's laws? That would be the worst decision you could make. I did not plan to say such harsh words, but if you insist on using the authority of the kingdom to conscript me, then I would be compelled to put up a bit of resistance. The two of them looked wordlessly at each other. The first to avert his eyes was Gazif. That would be frightening indeed. We would be wiped out before even crossing blades with the gentlemen of the slain theocracy. Wiped out? <laughs> well, that's a good joke. However, I am glad you understand me. Gazif narrowed his eyes and looked at Ainz, whose head was nodded in thanks. His words just now were not a joke. Gazif's instincts told him, making an enemy of this magic caster would be a fatal error. In the face of this life-threatening danger, his instincts were more reliable than his meager intellect. Who was he? Where did he come from? As Gazif thought, he looked at Ainz's strange mask. What did he look like under the mask? Was he someone that he knew? Or... What's wrong? Is there something on my mask? Uh, no, I simply felt that mask was very special. Since the mask is used to control that monster, then it must be a very powerful magic item. Am I correct? Well, about that. I should say that it's a very rare and valuable item. One could even say that it was exclusive. Possessing a potent magic item implied that the possessor was a skilled individual. By that logic, Ainz must have been a very talented magic caster. Gazif felt a little saddened for not being able to secure his aid. Although, part of him hoped that as an adventurer, Ainz would accept that request. I see it's meaningless to keep going on with this. Then, Master Gone, please take care of yourself. Once again, thank you for saving this village. Gazif removed his metal gauntlet and shook Ainz's hand. Originally, Ainz was thinking of removing his own Yarn Graber to return the courtesy, but in the end, he did not do so. Still, Gazif paid it no heed. He gripped Ainz's hand tightly and said, I am truly, truly grateful to you for protecting these innocent villagers from being slaughtered. Also, I know it's very selfish of me, and I have no authority to make you do anything. But I hope you can protect the villagers here. Just one more time. Right now, I have nothing to give you. But I hope that no matter what, you will heed my plea. I beg of you. About that. If you should ever visit the royal capital, I will give you anything you desire. I swear this on the name of Gazef Stronoff. Gazef let go of Ainz's hand, making to kneel but Ainz extended his hand to stop him. There is no need to go that far. Very well. I shall protect the villagers. I swear on the name of Ainz Ul Go. After hearing Ainz swear on his name, Gazif breathed a sigh of relief. Thank you very much, Master Gon. Now I have nothing more to worry about. All I need to do now is charge boldly ahead. Before that... Please, take this with you. Ainz took out an item and handed it to the smiling Gazif. It was a small, strangely carved statuette. There did not seem to be anything special about it. However... If it's a gift from your good self, I will gladly accept it. Then, Master Gon, time grows short, but I must now leave. Will you not wait until nightfall before setting out? The opposition should have spells like dark vision and the like, so night fighting is not to our advantage. But I cannot imagine they would be hampered by it. Also, 
We also need to let you see how we stand or fall. I see. As expected of the kingdom's warrior captain, your keen insight is truly worthy of praise. Then I wish you all the best, warrior captain. And I wish you a safe journey home, Master Gong. Ainz quietly watched Gaza's back shrinking into the distance as he rode off. Although her master seemed to be thinking about something, Albato did not inquire further. <laughs> when I first saw the humans here, I could not help but think of them as insects. But after speaking with them, I have come to be fond of them like small animals. Is that why you swore on your glorious name to protect them? Perhaps. No, I should say that it was in response to how he bravely rode to his death. Ainz admired it. He admired Gazif's determination, his strength of will that he did not have. Albedo, order the servants to search out the ambushes around us and knock them out once they are found. I will do so at once. Lord Ainz, the village chief and the others are here. Ainz turned to look at Albedo. He caught sight of the chief and two other villagers coming over. They reached Ainz's side, panting heavily. Filled with tension and unease, the chief spoke immediately, as though breathing were a luxury he could not afford. Lord Ainz, what should we do? Why did the warrior captain leave us behind and not protect us? The chief's words were filled with fear, but there was an undercurrent of anger there as well. He is doing what he must do, village chief. The foe has their eye on the warrior captain, and if he stayed here, the village would become a battlefield. The enemy will not let you flee, either. He left this place for your sake. Oh, I, I see. So that was why the warrior captain left. Then... then should we remain here? Of course not. They will come to kill you after they are done with the warrior captain and his men. As long as you remain within their encirclement, you will have nowhere to run. However, while the foe is dealing with the warrior captain and his troops, you will have a chance to flee. You should take it. So that was why the warrior captain rode out in force with his men. He planned to use himself as bait and lure the enemy away with a head-on attack. The chief red-facedly lowered his head as he heard about the warrior captain's slim chances. The man was riding to his death, just to give them a chance to flee. He cursed his inability to understand the man's sacrifice, and how he mistook Gazef's courage for selfishness and maligned him for it. I, I can't believe I jumped to conclusions and wrongly blamed a good man. Then, Lord Ainz, what should we do now? What do you mean by that? We live near the forest, but there's no guarantee that we won't be attacked by monsters. We were just lucky and thought that this place was safe, so we gave no thought to self-defense. And in the end, not only did we lose our friends and loved ones, but we also have become burdens. Now it was not just the chief, but the villagers behind him who had looks of regret on their faces. That could not be helped either. Your attackers were professional soldiers. If you had tried to resist, you might have all been dead before I got here. Ainz was trying to comfort the villagers, but none of them felt comforted at all. The fact was that no matter what pretty words he said, the loss of the villagers was an undeniable tragedy. All they could hope for was for time to heal their wounds. Village chief, there is no more time. You must move quickly so as not to waste the warrior captain's determination. I see. Then, Lord Ainz, what will you do? I will stay here and observe the situation, and then wait for a good time to escort you all away. We are always making trouble for you, Lord Ainz. Really, we... Think nothing of it. Because I made a promise to the warrior captain, in any case... Gather all of the villagers into one of the larger houses. I will further protect it with magic. He could feel his horse's agitation through his feet. Even a trained warhorse. No, it was because it was a warhorse that the beast knew it was riding into death. 
There were only four or five of the enemy surrounding the village, so there was a large gap between each of them. However, their encirclement was most likely airtight. In other words, they had set a trap for him, and if he sprang it, he would die. Even so, Gazif was still determined to break through them. No, going by the present circumstances, a forceful breakthrough was the only choice for him. He had no chance against them in ranged combat. If he had skilled archers by his side, it would be a different matter. If not, he had to avoid a long-range battle with magic casters. Fighting a defensive battle would be even more stupid. It would be one thing if they had stone-walled houses or a sturdy fort to fight from, but he had no confidence at all in the ability of wooden walls to stop magic. For all he knew, both Gazif and the houses might go up in smoke together. Therefore, the last tactic he could use was a thoroughly unethical one. That was to say, he would have to shift the theater of battle into the village and draw Ein's Ul Gon into the fight, thus forcing his involvement. But if he did that, it would completely defeat the purpose of coming here in the first place. Therefore, Gazif had to put himself into danger. Hit the enemy hard and draw in the sentries from around the village. After that, fall back immediately. Do not hesitate and miss your chance to flee. Sir, yes sir! After hearing the energetic replies from behind him, Gazif frowned. How many of the men here would be able to go back alive? They were not any more talented than ordinary people. Nor were they born with superpowers or special talents. They were just a group of men who had trained hard under Gazif. Losing the fruits of his labor here would be a terrible waste. Gazif was going to make a stupid, senseless sacrifice, and his men were going to follow him into it. He wanted to apologize to these men that he had drawn in with him. But once he turned around and saw them, those words died in his mouth. What he saw were the faces of true warriors, fearless men who knew where they were headed and who had swallowed any complaints about the matter. There was no need to apologize for the looks on his men's faces, that look which said that they knew they were riding into danger, but they would go into it regardless. One by one, the men shouted to the embarrassed Gazif, Don't worry, Captain! Yeah. We all came here of our own free will, to fight and die by your side, warrior captain. Please, let us protect our country, our people, and our friends. There was nothing left to say. Gazif returned their shouts with a thunderous cry. Forward! Tear their guts out! Gazif's men spurred their horses forward to follow their leader. The galloping horses shot across the plains like an arrow loosed from a bow. Still mounted, Gazif drew his bow and knocked an arrow to the string. Though his horse shook and shuddered beneath him, Gazif calmly drew the string back. The loosed arrow struck its target unerringly, piercing the head of the frontmost magic caster. Or at least, that was what he thought would happen. It was useless after all. Maybe if I had a magic arrow, but you know, I don't have what I don't have. Griping about it here is pointless. The arrow bounced off like it had struck a sturdy helmet. That supernatural hardness must have been the work of magic. Just as Gazov had said, in order to shoot through magic that protected against ranged attacks, he would need a magic weapon of his own. Since Gazif did not have a weapon like that, he stopped shooting and put away his bow. The magic casters began their counterattack and cast their spells. Gazif focused his energies and took a stance in order to resist their magic. Just then, the horse between his legs whinnied loudly and reared up, its front legs kicking the air. Go, go, go! He tightly gripped his reins and leaned forward, practically hugging the horse. Fortunately, his swift reflexes kept Gazif from being thrown off. While it had caused a sheen of cold sweat to bloom all over his body, at the very least, 
he had managed to suppress his brief panic. There was something far more important before him. A flustered and panting Gazev lashed his mount's flanks, but the horse remained still, as though someone more important than its rider were giving it orders. This strange phenomenon could only mean one thing. Mind-controlling magic. The horse had been affected by such a spell. Gazev might have been able to fight off its effects, but the affected party was not a magical beast, but a mere warhorse, so resistance was not to be expected. Anger flared up in Gaza for not predicting such an obvious form of attack. He leapt off his horse and his galloping subordinates guided their mounts around him, flowing past him on both sides. Warrior Captain! The last men of the group slowed down, extending their hands. They wanted to help Gazif onto their horse, but the angel looking down upon them from the heavens swooped down faster. Gazif drew his sword and swung at the angel. The steel blade became a swift flash of light. The stroke of the kingdom's strongest man was enough to cleave a man's body in two, but the angel was not a man, and although it had taken a grave wound to its torso, it was not slain yet. The blood spraying into the air was the mana that composed the angel. It vanished like smoke. No need for that! Turn around and charge them! After Gazif gave his orders, he turned a keen glare at the angel which had escaped with its life. It had been badly hurt, but it was still trying to find holes in Gazif's defenses. So that's how it is. A strange feeling ran up his arms when his blade found its mark. Gazif knew what it was. These monsters had a skill that would greatly reduce any damage done to them unless the attacking weapon was made of a special material. It was thanks to this ability that the angel could take a blow from Gazif without falling. If that was the case, Gazif focused his energies within himself and activated the martial art Focus Battle Aura and his blade glowed with a crimson light. The angel took this opportunity to cut in with a sword of red flame. However, too slow. In the eyes of the kingdom's strongest warrior, Gazif Stronoff, the angel's movements were truly too slow. Gazif's sword moved. This blow was far more powerful than the one before it, and Gazif's sword sheared neatly through the angel's body. Its body destroyed. The angel seemed to melt in midair, its glittering wings flapping a few times before vanishing, as though it had been nothing more than an illusion. If Gazif had not been in such dire straits, he might well have applauded the light show. However, he did not have the time for that at the moment. Gazif looked around, saw the enemies advancing on him in an endless tide, and smiled. More angels flashed into existence around them as well. Gazif was well aware that they were not ordinary reinforcements. So anything goes with magic, huh? Damn as he cursed the magic casters who could easily do what warriors could not. Gazif calmly took stock of the enemies surrounding him and confirmed that this was everyone who was surrounding the village. That would mean that the encirclement of the village was lifted. Then, Master Go, the rest is up to you. The knowledge that he could save the surviving villagers filled Gazif's heart with endless joy. He smiled at the enemy's carelessness. And then, the sound of hoofbeats filtered into Gazif's ears. It was the sound of Gazif's subordinates charging back into the battle. I told you to scatter once the blockade went down. Truly, you're a bunch of fools. And truly, I'm proud of you. Gazif sprinted forward. This might well be the best and only chance to end the battle. Judging by the speed of the horsemen, the enemy magic casters would need to focus all their attention on them. He would take advantage of this opportunity to cause chaos in their ranks. That was the only way. His men's horses whinnied and reared up, just like Gazif's own horse did. Several men moaned in pain as they were thrown off their horses, and the angels took the chance to press the attack. Although his subordinates were on par with the angels in terms of fighting power, the latter had special abilities which the former did not possess. 
and Gazef's men were soon plunged into dire straits. As he had expected, more than half of his men were fighting desperately for their lives. The spells of the magic casters only made things that much worse for them. His men fell to the ground, one after the other. Gazev averted his eyes and ran forward again. His target was the enemy commander. He did not think the enemy would retreat if their commander went down, but that was the only way to save everyone. Over 30 angels put themselves in the charging Gazef's way. He frowned as he saw the heavy defenses ahead of him. Out of my way! Gazev activated his trump card. Heat bloomed from his hands and spread to envelop his entire body. Gazif broke the limits of his physical body and stepped into the realm of heroes. In addition, he activated several martial arts at once. One could call those a warrior's magic. Gazif glared at the six angels surrounding him. Sixfold slash of light. This was a martial art that struck as fast as light. In one move, he hit the six angels around him. All six of them were cut in half, dissolving into motes of light. The reinforcements from the slain theocracy gasped in surprise, while Gazif's men cheered. Although his ultimate attack made his arms cramp up, it was not enough to decrease his fighting effectiveness. Then, as though ordered to drown out the cheers, a huge wave of angels swept in and one of them lunged at Gazif with its flaming sword. Instant counter! Gazif used his martial art just as the angel swung, and his body blurred away like mist. Halfway through its attack, the angel took a hit from Gazif. That hit reduced it to glittering dust. But Gazif's offensive did not end there. Flow acceleration! With fluid, graceful moves, he dispatched the angels one after the other. His ultimate attack took down two more angels again. This splendid display of martial technique inspired Gazif's men and gave them a ray of hope. But the Theocracy's troops would not allow that to happen, and their commander erased that hope with mockery. <laughs> well done! However, that is all you can do. Clerks who have lost your angels, summon new ones! Focus all of your spells on Stronoff! The heat which had been building in the air immediately cooled off. This is bad. Gazin took down another angel as he muttered to himself. It would seem there would not be any more cheering, no matter how many angels Gazif slew, since his men were worrying about the enemy coming at them. They were superior in numbers, equipment, training, and individual ability. The sole weapon of Gazif's beleaguered men their hope for victory was gone. After unconsciously evading an incoming sword, Gazif counterattacked and destroyed an angel in one hit. However, the enemy he was aiming for was still far away. Although his subordinates hoped otherwise, they needed magic weapons to break through the angels' damage reduction. They did not know how to use the focus battle or a martial art like Gazif could. And without magic weapons, even if Gazif's men could injure the angels, they could not finish them off. They were at their wits' end. Gazif bit his lip and continued slashing. His record for the most consecutive uses of his ultimate attack, six-fold slash of light, was rapidly increasing. A warrior like Gazif could use six different kinds of martial arts at once, and combined with his hidden ultimate attack, that made seven martial arts at once. Until now, he had been using martial arts to improve his physical attributes, fortify his mind, improve his magic resistance, temporarily render his weapon magical, as well as another technique that he used on hitting an opponent. That made five martial arts. The reason why he had not pushed himself to the limit and used all seven at once was because powerful martial arts depleted one's concentration in particular, the six-fold slash of light required three times the focus of his other techniques. Gazif had two ultimate attacks like this, but he could only use them with four other martial arts at the same time. He could easily defeat an angel with those techniques, 
but even if he struck them down, more of them were summoned anew. As long as he did not defeat their summoners, they would call up more angels to face him. While trying to run the opposition out of mana was an option, Gazif would probably tire before that. The truth was, Gazif's arms were growing heavier and heavier, and his heart was racing. Instant Counter was a martial art that forcibly corrected the body's balance after making an attack, resetting it to before the blow was struck. While that meant that the practitioner could immediately attack again, the forced reset of the body would place immense strain on it. Flow acceleration was a martial art that increased the speed at which one's nerves functioned, increasing one's attack rate. However, that technique created fatigue in the brain. And then, there was the ultimate attack, the six-fold slash of light. Using them put a great burden on the body, but without them, you would have no chance at all. Bring them all on. Your angels are nothing. His fearsome shout startled the theocracy troops, but they soon recovered and renewed the offensive on Gazif. Pay him no heed. That is simply the roar of a caged beast. Do not worry, my brothers. Deplete his strength bit by bit, but do not get too close. That beast's claws are long and sharp. Gazif glared at the man with a scar on his face. If only he could defeat him, he could turn the battle around. The problem was the other angel near him, different from the ones with the flaming swords. And then, there was the great distance between them and the several layers of defenses in the way. They were simply too far apart. The beast is about to make a break for it. Show him the meaning of the word impossible. The man's calm voice only served to aggravate Gazif further. Even if he stepped into the realm of heroes, Gazif could not win with his refined melee techniques alone. Still, so what? If that was the only road available to him, then he would have to charge down it with all his might. As the strength returned to his eyes, Gazif began his charge. However, the road ahead was hard, like he had expected. The angels loomed before him, one after the other, swinging their swords of scorching red flame. As he evaded and counterattacked and destroyed the angels one after the other, Gazif suddenly felt an intense pain. It felt like he had been struck hard in the belly. As he looked in the direction of the pain, he saw a group of magic casters casting a spell of some sort. Well, if your priests... You should act like it. How about a little healing over here? As though to answer Gazef's jive, an invisible force smashed into Gazef's body. Even if the enemy used invisible attacks, Gazef was confident that he could avoid them by reading traces in the air and the looks on his opponent's faces. That might even have worked if there were only a few of them. However, against 30 of those attacks, there was nothing he could do. Just keeping his sword in his hands was taking all his strength. The pain filled his body. He had no idea where it was coming from, only that it was so great it almost made him collapse. Gah! The taste of steel welled up in his throat and Gaza spat a mouthful of fresh blood. The sticky eye core welled out of his mouth and stained his chin. Gaza's legs were shaky after that barrage of invisible blows, and now... An angel was swinging its flaming sword at him. He could not avoid the blow. It struck his armor. Fortunately, it deflected the sword, but the impact traveled through the breastplate and deep into his body. He swung wildly at the angel, but his poor balance meant that the angel easily evaded the attack. Gazif's sword trembled in his hands as he gasped for breath. The fatigue that filled his body seemed to be whispering into his ear, telling him to just lie down and rest. The hunt has entered its final stages. Do not let the beast rest. Order your angels to attack consecutively. Even though Gazif desperately wanted a moment to recover, the angels surrounding him obeyed their masters and mercilessly attacked him, one after the other. He somehow evaded the attack from behind and parried a thrust from the side. 
He used the strong angles of his armor to deflect an angel's charge from above. Gazif wanted to counterattack his foes, but he was greatly outnumbered. As his strength diminished, he could only take out one opponent at a time, since he lacked the stamina to use martial arts. As his subordinates fell one by one, the enemy's attacks were concentrated on him. With no way to break through the enemy's encirclement, he felt death closing in on him. His concentration faltered, and he nearly fell to one knee. He desperately tried to refocus so he could fight. The invisible impacts came again, striking the tottering Gazif. The world before him shook mightily. Not good. Gazif used all his strength to try and maintain his balance. However, something seemed wrong with his body, and the strength that should have held him up was nowhere to be found. The itch of touching the grass spread through his body, and Gazif realized that he had fallen. He struggled to rise again, but his body betrayed him. The angels' swords meant death for him. Now, finish him off. But do not send in one, angel. Use them all to ensure he is dead. Yes, he was dead. His well-trained hands were shaking uncontrollably, and he could not pick up his longsword. Even so, he could not give up. His gritted teeth made creaking sounds. Gazif was not afraid of death. He had taken many lives in the past, so he was prepared to meet his end on the battlefield. Like he had told Ainz, he was hated by people. That hatred became a sword that would one day pierce his body. But he could not accept an end like this. They had attacked several villages and murdered defenseless, innocent villagers, all to lure Gazif into a trap. He could not allow himself to die at the hands of honorless dogs like this, and he could not bear his powerlessness. Ah! Don't look down on me! He shouted with all the strength in his body. Blood dribbled out the side of his mouth as Gazif rose to his feet. A man who should have been powerless to stand now stood proudly. The mighty force of his presence forcing back the angels that surrounded him. <sighs> Just getting his feet made it hard to breathe. His mind was a blur, and his body felt like it had turned to mud. But he could not lie down. If he lay down, all would be lost. This little bit of pain he felt could not compare to the suffering of the dead villagers. I am the warrior captain of the Reistee's kingdom. I am the man who loves and defends this country. How can I lose to bastards like you, stain my country with your footsteps? He was certain that that great man would protect the villagers. Then, what he should do was defeat as many of the enemy as he could so the people would not meet the same fate as all the others. Protecting the future people of the kingdom, that was all he wanted to do. <laughs> you will die here because all you can do is babble that nonsense, Gazef Stronov. Gazef glared at the enemy commander as his cruel mockery reached his ears. Oh, if only you would abandon these villagers on the border. You would not be dying here. You probably don't know, but your life is far, far more valuable than even a thousand of these peasants. If you truly loved your country, you should have abandoned them to die. You and I will never see eye to eye. Let's go! What can that body of yours do? Cease your pointless struggles and lie down quietly as a final act of mercy. I will kill you without drawing out your suffering. If you think I'm helpless, then why don't you come and take my head? It should be easy if I'm like this, right? <clears throat> You're all talk. It looks like you still want to fight. Do you think you can win? Gazif simply stared straight ahead his hands trembling as he gripped his sword. He focused on the enemy in front of him, ignoring the angels surrounding him. 
What a pointless effort. Truly, you are an idiot. After we kill you, we will then massacre the villagers you saved. All you have done is brought them a fear-filled stay of execution. Gazif was smiling brightly. Uh, what's so funny? <laughs> you fool. In that village is a man who is stronger than even me. His power is unfathomable. But he could easily take you all out by himself. Trying to kill the villagers he protects is impossible for you. <laughs> oh, someone stronger than the kingdom's greatest warrior? Oh, come now. Do you think boasting like that will do you any good? Oh, huh, you truly are an idiot. Gazif was still smiling. What kind of look would Nigun have on his face when he met that inscrutable man called Ein's Ulgon? Seeing that would probably be the best gift Gazif could receive before heading off to the afterlife. <laughs> Angels! <laughs> uh, kill Gazif, Stronoff. Countless wings moved in response to that cold, cruel order. Gazif steeled himself, preparing to run forward. When suddenly, a voice came past him. Looks like it's about time to switch. The scenery before Gazif changed, and he was no longer on that blood-soaked plain. Instead, he was in the corner of what looked like a simple village hut. There were worried-looking villagers all around him. This... this is... This is a warehouse that Lord Hines has protected with his magic. So it seems, Chief. Master... Master Gown doesn't seem to be here. No, he was here just a moment ago. But he seems to have vanished without a trace, and in his place, you appeared, Warrior Captain. I see. So the voice in my head was... Gazif allowed himself to relax. He would have no part to play in what would come next. Gazif collapsed to the ground, and the villagers hurriedly drew closer. The six scriptures, an enemy that even Gazif Stronoff, the strongest warrior in the region, could not hope to defeat. Yet, he could not even begin to imagine that Ainz would lose. There was no trace of the intense battle that had taken place earlier on the plains. The light of the setting sun covered up the blood staining the ground, and the stench of blood was blown away by the wind. There were two figures on the plains who had not originally been there. Nigun of the Slain Theocracy's Special Operations Unit, the Sunlight Scripture, looked at them with perturbation in his eyes. One of them was dressed like an arcane magic caster, he wore an evil-looking mask to hide his face and a pair of iron gauntlets on his hands. He wore an expensive-looking black robe, suggesting he was a person of some status. The other one was dressed in a suit of jet-black full-plate armor. It looked very impressive, and it was certainly some sort of masterwork magic item. One look at the exterior was enough to tell that it was a high-end magic item. The beleaguered Gazif and his men were gone without a trace. In their place were these two mysterious individuals. It seemed to be some kind of teleportation magic, but he had no idea what kind of spell had been used here. He had to be wary of the mysterious magic caster. Nigun called the angels back, ordering them to form a defensive perimeter on their side. His assiduous gaze studied their movements, and then the magic caster stepped forward. Pleased to meet you, gentlemen of the slain theocracy. I am Arns Ul Gome. I would be glad if you could call me Arns. He was some distance away from them, but the wind carried his voice over clearly. Nigun did not respond, and thus the mysterious man called Arns continued. The person behind me is Albedo. I would like to make a deal with you. Might I have a moment of your time? Nigun tried to attach some meaning to the name Ainz Ul Gon, 
but it was no use. It might be an alias. Perhaps trying to glean some information from him would be more productive. With that, Nigun raised his chin, indicating that Ainz should continue. Wonderful. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Then I would like to start by making one thing clear to you gentlemen. That would be... There is no way you can defeat me. He could hear the absolute confidence in that statement. This was not a bluff or a boast. This was something that the man Ainz Ulgon believed. From the bottom of his heart, Nigun furrowed his brows. In the slain theocracy, nobody would dare speak in such a way to their betters. Huh. Ignorance is truly deplorable. You will pay the price for your foolishness. Really now? Do you really think that will happen? I observed your battle earlier, so my presence here would indicate that I am confident of victory. After all, if I was not sure that I could beat you, would it not be wiser for me to leave that man to die? He was right. An arcane magic caster would be better suited to different kinds of confrontations. Arcaners, sorcerers, and wizards could only use light armor, so they would want to avoid melee combat using fly to repeatedly launch fireballs and other such spells from afar. Yet, Ainz had chosen to face them head on. He must have a trick up his sleeve. After a period of silence, Ainz spoke again. I have a question for you, if you can understand it. The angels you have brought with you should have been summoned by third-tier magic. Am I correct? He was stating the obvious. Ainz went on, ignoring Nigun's puzzled expression. The monsters you summoned are similar to those in Yggdrasil, so I was curious as to whether the names were the same. Many of Yggdrasil's monsters were derived from mythology. Monsters like angels or demons should be no exception. Said angels and demons are most commonly associated with Christianity, but it seems quite unnatural that something called an archangel exists in a world without Christianity. That would mean someone like myself must exist in this world. Nigun had no idea what Ainz was talking about, and his ire was rising. He asked, th th That's enough of your self-absorbed prattle. Now, tell me, where is Stronov? I teleported him to the village. <laughs> what? Nigun had not expected Ainz to answer. He thought of why Ainz would say that, and replied, <laughs> How foolish! Listen, even if you tell a lie like that, a quick search of the village will- It is not a lie. I merely answered your question. Well, then, there is another reason for why I answered your question. Could it be that you wish to beg for mercy? Well, if you help us save some time, I can consider it. <laughs> Oh, no, no, no. Well, the truth is, I overheard your conversation with the warrior captain. What a lot of balls you have. Ainz's tone changed suddenly, and he continued speaking as he looked at the mocking Nigun. To think you would dare say that you would massacre the villagers that I, Ainz Ul Gon, took the time to personally rescue. I cannot think of anything that is more offensive than that. Ainz's robe rippled in the wind. That same wind blew across Nigun and his company. The cold wind just happened to be blowing from Ainz's direction. But Nigun hurriedly brushed away the phantom image that loomed in front of him. Yes, that vision of death before him must have been an illusion. What... <clears throat> what do you mean by offensive, Magicaster? What of it? Although he was obviously frightened, Nigun did not change his mocking tone. He was the commander of one of the slain theocracy's secret weapons, the Sunlight Scripture. How could he be afraid of a single man's name? It was impossible. It could not be possible. Yet. I mentioned a deal earlier. These are the terms. You will hand your lives over to me without resistance. 
In exchange, you will not have to suffer. However, if you put up a fight, then the price you fools shall pay is to die in despair and agony. Eines took a step forward. It was just a single step, but Eines's body seemed to swell massively before their eyes. Cowed by him, the men of the Sunlight Scripture reflexively took a step back. Several hoarse cries came from around Nigun. They were cries of fear. His presence was filled with an unimaginable power. This was the first time Nigun had been faced with such a might. Therefore, he could understand his men's fear. Nigun was a powerful individual himself, a veteran of many battles who had grazed the edge of death countless times, who had taken many lives. He could feel the might radiating from the mysterious magic caster, an oppressive, potent pressure. It must have been worse for his men. What kind of being was he? What was the true identity of this magic caster? Who was the man beneath the mask? Once more, Eines ignored Negun's panic and spoke coldly. That is why I did not lie to you and answered your question honestly. It is because there is no point in lying to those that are about to die. Ein spread his arms and took another step forward. He looked like he was about to hug them, but his evil-looking fingers reminded them of a lunging monster. A thrill of cold ran from the bottoms of Nigun's feet to the top of his head. He had felt this countless times in his struggles along the edge of life and death. It was a sign of impending doom. Have the angels charge him! Do not let them get close! Nigun's voice broke slightly as he shouted his orders. It sounded more like a scream. It was not to raise his men's spirits. He was simply afraid of Einzul Gon. Two archangel flames flapped their wings in response to Nigun's command, launching an attack. The angels flew straight up to Ainz and stabbed him with their flaming swords. Albedo, who was standing behind him, should have blocked that attack. And so all of the Sunlight Scripture, who had been predicting that course of action, could not believe their eyes. It was not that anything happened. On the contrary, nothing happened. Indeed, the man called Ainzul Gon took no action. He simply allowed the angels to run him through. He did not dodge, block, cast a spell, or have his follower intercept it. Nothing happened. Their shock became mockery. That act, pretending to be some mighty figure, was nothing but a bluff. It was not that Alberto did not wish to block it, but that Alberto could not respond in time to the high-speed attack of the Archangel Flame. Now that the truth was out, they did not seem like anything special at all. His men breathed sighs of relief. Nigun, who felt quite silly for being so afraid, turned to Alberto. How unsightly! To think he would try to scare us with a bluff. Suddenly, a question came to mind. Why was Einz's corpse not falling? What, what are you doing? Call back the angels. He can't fall down with those swords stuck in him. But, but we've already given the order, sir. His subordinates' confused voices startled Nigun, and he looked at Einz again. The angels were desperately flapping their wings like butterflies caught in a spider's web. The two angels slowly moved to the side. However, their movements were very strange. It looked as though someone was pushing them aside. Following that, the body of Ainz, which had been blocked by the angels, appeared once more from the gap between them. I told you, didn't I? There is no way you gentlemen can defeat me. Shouldn't you heed the warnings of others? The calm voice filtered into Nigun's ears. He could not comprehend the sight before him. He was stabbed through his chest and abdomen, but Eins was still standing, as though nothing were wrong. Impossible! One of Nigun's subordinates moaned, 
giving voice to the words in Nigun's heart. Judging from the angle of the angels' swords, they had to be fatal wounds. Even so, Ainz did not seem to be in any pain. That was not the only shocking thing. Ainz was gripping each of the angels by the throat. The angels struggled against him, but Ainz did not let them go. Impossible! Someone was muttering to themselves. Angels summoned from magic had bodies created from their summoners' mana, so they were definitely not light. They weighed more than a grown man, and then there was the weight of their armor to consider as well. There was no way they could be lifted up by the throat so easily. Granted, a well-trained warrior with a stout and muscular body might be able to do it. But the man before him, Ainz, was a magic caster who should have focused on training his intellect and arcane powers over honing his physique. Even if he were enhanced by magic, he would not be able to do anything if his base strength was low to begin with. Then why was this happening? Why did he seem completely unfazed, even after being impaled? There has to be some sort of trick. Uh, definitely. How could anyone be fine after being run through by a sword? Panic and fear spread through the slain Theocracy's Special Forces unit. They were all veterans of numerous battles and had experienced many dangers in the past. But this was a sight they had never seen before. Not even the angels that Negun could summon were capable of such a feat. The doubtful mutterings about how he did not seem to be in pain and was speaking normally crept into Negun's ears. High tier physical nullification. A passive skill that negates the attacks of weapons with low data content and low tier monsters attacks. It only protects against attacks of up to level 60. In other words, attacks above level 60 can harm me. It is an all-or-nothing ability. To think it would actually see use here. Well then, these angels are in the way. Holding an angel in each hand, Ein slammed them both into the ground. There was a thunderous crash, and the earth trembled from the impact. A testament to Ein's supernatural strength. The angels died instantly, reverting to countless dancing motes of light which vanished into the air. Of course, the sword stuck in Ainz vanished as well. If I know how the angels were named, I can then understand how you can all use Yggdrasil's magic. But let us leave this aside for now. As Ainz slowly straightened up, he was still talking about things which nobody could understand. However, that only intensified the Sunlight Scripture's fear of his mysterious power. Negun gulped. All right, we'll end these pointless games here. Are you satisfied? Since it looks like you aren't willing to accept the deal, then it shall be my turn. Eines opened those hands of his. Those hands which had crushed two angels to death. He seemed to be showing them that he had nothing in them. His voice carried clearly through the bone-chilling silence into the ears of everyone present. Are you ready? It'll be a massacre. A sudden spike of cold pierced his spine, followed by a surge of nausea. Nigun, the hardened killer who had presided over many slaughters, was now feeling something that he had never felt before. He had to run. He had no way of beating Ainz, so doing battle with him would be very dangerous. However, Negun struggled to shake that feeling away. He had cornered his prey, Gazif. How could he watch him get away now? Still, a warning resonated from the depths of his soul. Negun shouted his order. All angels, attack! Hurry! Every one of the Archangel Flames shot toward Ainz like bullets. What a lively lot. Albedo, step back. Negan could hear the cool, calm voice of someone who was being attacked by angels, but did not care. Ainz was surrounded by so many angels that nobody could even see him, but yet his voice did not carry even the slightest hint of worry. It looked like he would be impaled by countless blades. No, 
Ainz's spell took effect before that. Negative burst! The air shuddered. A wave of black radiance erupted from Ainz, like the negative image of a camera flash. It only lasted for an instant, but it had an immediate and obvious effect. I impossible! Someone muttered those words, carried by the wind. They could not believe what was happening before their eyes. The angels, over 40 of them, had been annihilated by the Black Wave. Their opponent had not used Dispel Magic to neutralize the summons. The angels that were blown away by the Black Wave had taken damage. In other words, Ainz had used a powerful spell to wipe out all the angels in one fell swoop. Nigun could not help but tremble. He recalled the words of the kingdom's strongest warrior, Gazif Stronoff. <laughs> you fool. In that village is a man who is stronger than even me. His power is unfathomable, but he could easily take you all out by himself. Trying to kill the villagers he protects is impossible for you. The scene before him proved the truth of those words. Negan erased those words from his mind, trying desperately to bring himself over. Negan knew that the members of the strongest special ops group, the Black Scripture, could also eliminate this many angels. In other words, all he had to do was treat Ainz as an opponent on their level. While he might be as strong as a member of the Black Scripture, he had the advantage of numbers on his side, so victory was still possible. However, could those members of the Black Scripture take care of all these angels with just one spell? Negun shook his head to clear away his doubts. He could not think of that question. If he got his answer, then he would truly be done for. Therefore, Negun reached inside his coat and touched the item within to give himself courage. He fervently believed that as long as he held it, everything would be fine. However, his subordinates did not have the same source of moral support that he did. It's not possible. It's impossible. Once they realized their angels were useless, they wailed and fell back upon the spells that they knew and trusted. Charm person! Fire ray! Holy ray! Open wound! Confusion! All kinds of spells rained down on Ainz. Yet, even as the storm of magic lashed against him, Ainz was unmoved. Well, all of these are familiar spells. Who taught them to you? The slain theocracy? Someone else? There are more and more things I want to ask you now. Not only could he slaughter all of their summoned angels in one move, their spells were also incapable of harming him. Negun felt like he was trapped in a nightmare. <coughs> one of the men screamed wildly as he saw that his spells were ineffective. In desperation, he pulled out a sling and loaded it with a bullet. Although Negun doubted the effectiveness of such a projectile, when even an angel's sword was useless, he did not stop the man. The bullet that could easily shatter bone sped toward Ainz. It was followed by a sound. That sound was like an explosion. An instant. It had happened in an instant. Since they were in battle, they could not take their eyes off their target. However, Alberto, who should have been behind, had moved in a mysterious way in front of Ainz to defend him. The source of the apparent explosion was because she had violently kicked off the ground to get to where she was. With a speed that the eye could not even see, Alberto swung her bardiche, tracing a beautiful curve of the weapon's sickly green light in the air. After that, the man with the sling slowly collapsed to the ground. Huh? Nobody knew what had happened. They were the ones who had launched the attack. Yet the result was completely opposite. One of them had fallen instead. One of the men went over to inspect his dead comrade, and he shouted, His... his head has been smashed in. What? Smashed? Don't tell me it's the sling bullet he threw! Just then, 
the wind carried a voice into the puzzled Negun's ears. My apologies. It would seem my subordinate used a combination of the missile parry and counter arrow skills to return your projectile to your man. I believe you have some sort of magic which defends against ranged attacks on your persons. That would mean an attack that is stronger than the defense will break through it, no? It's hardly worth panicking about. After his explanation, Ainz paid no attention to Nigun and turned to Albedo. Although, Albedo, you should know that ranged weapons like that will not be able to harm me. There was no need to- Please wait, Lord Ainz. Anyone who wishes to do battle with the Supreme Being must at least have a certain degree of strength. A sling bullet like that was nothing more than an insult to you. <laughs> so, that means Nagoon and his lackeys fail the test then. <coughs> Principality of Observation! Get him! In response to Nigun's orders, the angel that had been standing by up till now suddenly spread its wings and flapped propelling itself forward. The Principality of Observation was an angel in full body armor. It held a mace in one hand and a round shield in the other. A garment that looked like a long skirt covered its legs. The Principality of Observation was stronger than the Archangel Flames, but it had not been deployed into battle until now because of its special skill. In accordance with its name, the Principality of Observation had the ability to raise the defense of all its allies. However, this ability lost its effect once the Angel moved, so the wise decision would be to order the Principality of Observation to hold its ground. The fact that Nigun had ordered it to attack was a sign that he was grasping at straws. He had to clutch at anything which might turn out to be a lifeline, even if it ended up being chaff. Fall back, Albedo. As ordered, the angel drew up in front of Ainz and raised its shining mace. Ainz nonchalantly reached out his gauntleted left hand to meet the attack. While it would not have been surprising for that strike to shatter bone, Ainz's hand was fine. He casually took the subsequent hits as they came. Good grief. I guess it's my turn now. Hellflame. A small, wobbling mote of flame emerged from one of the fingers of Ainz's right hand. It looked so feeble that anyone could blow it out if they wanted. It touched the body of the Principality of Observation and looked terribly laughable against the glittering body of the angel. But then, the Principality of Observation was consumed by a black fire so intense that even Migu a good distance away could feel the heat. He could barely keep his eyes open. The angel's body melted and vanished amidst the sky scorching black flames without so much as the chance to resist. The flames that devoured the angel vanished with their target. No traces were left behind. The previous scene, that of the angel's attack and the black conflagration felt like they had been illusions like they had never happened. In just one hit? In, 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 impossible! He didn't even know he was shouting. He was simply converting his thoughts into words. It didn't feel like shouting to him. The Principality of Observation was a high-tier angel whose offensive and defensive strength were in a 3 to 7 ratio. It boasted the strongest defense of all other angels in its tier. In addition, Nigun's natural-born talent, Enhanced Summoned Monster, could improve the stats of any monster Nigun summoned. As a result, there were very few people who could defeat a Principality of Observation summoned by Nigun. Nigun had never seen anyone defeated with just one spell. Even the Black Scripture, whose members' power pressed against the limits of humanity, could not do it. In other words, Ainz Ulgon's power exceeded that of mankind. It... it can't be! It's impossible! Nobody can defeat a high-tier angel with just one spell! What kind of a man are you, Ainz Ulgon? It's impossible that no one's heard of you before! What is your real name? There was no trace of calm left in Nigun. Just his wild screaming in the hope of denying reality. 
Ein spread his hands once more. Under the light of the setting sun, they looked like they were drenched in blood. Why do you think it is impossible? Is that not just the result of your ignorance? Or do you mean to say that this is all you know of the world? There is only one thing I can do to answer your question. Silence reigned in the air as they awaited the answer. Eins's voice was as clear as a bell. My name is Eins Ul Go. It is definitely not an alias. In the face of Eins's arrogance, Negan was unable to rebut what he was hearing. It was something he did not understand from a man he did not know. That was the situation he was in. Negun was starting to get annoyed by his rapid breathing. The sound of grass rustling in the wind was annoying too. His heartbeat sounded especially loud. He was breathing heavily, like he had been running for a long time. Words of reassurance began appearing in his head. However, the sight of Ainz being stabbed with swords, as well as his mass slaughter of angels with just one spell, were telling Nigun something else. That... that is a monster beyond my wildest imaginings. I could never hope to defeat it. Captain, what should we do? Figure it out yourself! I'm not your damn mother! Nigun only managed to calm down after he could no longer see the face of the man he was shouting at. Losing his cool in front of an unknown monster like this was a very bad thing. The sun was slowly falling below the horizon, and darkness threatened to swallow the world. It felt like death itself was opening its maw to devour everything. Negun tried to force his fear back, and gave an order. Protect me! Protect me if you want to live! Negun brought the crystal out in his trembling hand. His subordinates, usually vigorous and nimble, were chained down by fear and their movements were slow. Even these fearless men would hesitate when ordered to become a shield against a monster like the one which stood before them. However, he had to have them by him sometime, no matter what. The magic sealed within the crystal could summon the most powerful angel known to man. It was an angel that had single-handedly destroyed a demon god that rampaged throughout the land 200 years ago. It was an angel of the highest order that could easily destroy a city. Casting the spell to summon that angel again required an incalculable amount of money and manpower, but Ein's Ul Gon, this mysterious being, was worthy of being eliminated by its power. More importantly, it would be worse if the crystal was taken without the spell being cast. This was what Nigun told himself. He concealed his fear that he would become a lump of meat, like his deceased underling. I am going to summon an angel of the highest order! Hurry up and buy me some time! Once they realized the truth, his subordinates moved swiftly. Eins, who was facing them, should have noticed the flames of hope blazing up. However, he made no move, instead babbling about some nonsense to himself. Could that be a spell-sealing crystal? And from its brilliance, it should be something that can seal anything except a super cheer spell. So they have an Yggdrasil item like that as well. That being the case, what kind of angel can they summon? Seraph Glass? Albedo, protect me with your skill. Well, I don't think they can bring out a Seraph Aesphere. If they manage to summon a Seraph Empyrean, we will have to fight them seriously. Or rather... Could it be a monster unique to this world? While Ainz held his ground, Nigun ritually broke the crystal in his hand, and a brilliant radiance spilled forth. A hidden sun seemed to have risen upon the land, dyeing the grass a blinding white. A dull fragrance filtered into everyone's noses. The legendary angel descended upon the earth, and Nigun exulted. Behold! The glorious visage of the highest angel! Dominion Authority! It was a mass of many shining wings, and among them were a pair of arms that held a scepter, symbolizing royal authority, but there was no head or legs visible. Though it looked quite disturbing, 
anyone could tell this was a sacred being. In the moment it appeared, the surrounding air turned bright and clear. The advent of this supreme incarnation of goodness drew wild cheers from everyone who saw it. The blood of Nigun's men boiled with excitement. Now they could kill Ein Zulgon. This time, he would be the one to be afraid. He would learn his foolishness before the power of the gods. In the face of their jubilance, Ein's barely managed to get a sentence out. This... This is it. This is what you call getting serious. This is your ace in the hole that you were planning to use on me. As he saw Ainz's shock, Nigun, who had been extremely uneasy, breathed a sigh of relief. In fact, his heart was filled with joy as he replied, Indeed, your fear is only natural. After all, this is what an angel of the highest order looks like. While using it here seems a bit of a waste, I have determined you are worthy of it. How could this be? I'm at a loss for words. Ein slowly raised his hand and covered his face. To Nigun, it looked like a gesture of despair. Ein Zulgon, the truth is, you deserve respect for forcing me to summon this most exalted of angels. Be proud of your fearsome strength, magic caster. Nigun nodded deeply and continued. Personally speaking, I would like to bring you into our fold, if you truly are that powerful. However, I am not allowed to do so on this mission. At the very least, I shall remember you. The magic caster who made me decide to summon this mighty angel! However, the response to Nigun's praise was a cold voice. Really? This is ridiculous. <laughs> what? Nigun had no idea what Ainz was saying. To Nigun, Ainz was little more than a sacrifice to the highest order of angel, which humanity could not possibly defeat. Yet his attitude seemed too relaxed for that. I can't believe I was on guard against such child's play. My apologies, Albedo. I made you use your skill for nothing. Please do not say that, Lord Ainz. We did not know what manner of monster they might have called forth, so it was prudent to reduce the chance of injury. Is that so? Hmm. No, you're right. It's just that I did not expect this to be all. It was quite unexpected. Negun's mind could not keep up with their patronizing banter. How? How, how can you act like that in front of the Angel of the Highest Order? Negun shouted. He could not believe that Ainz and Alberto were chatting leisurely and completely ignoring Dominion authority. Their calm attitude of absolute superiority made the surging joy in Negun's heart vanish. In its place was terror and unease. Could it be? That Ainz Ulgon is more powerful than this, mightiest of angels? No! Impossible! It can't be! Nobody can be stronger than the highest place of angels! This is a being which can defeat a demon god! In the face of a foe that humanity cannot beat, it's... it's a bluff! It must be a bluff! It would seem Negun could no longer control his emotions. He could not, would not acknowledge this. He could not believe that a man who could defeat Dominion Authority was not only an enemy of the slain Theocracy, but was standing right in front of him. Y y use it! Use Holy Smite! This was magic of the seventh tier and above, a realm humanity could not reach. Even the large-scale rituals in the slain Theocracy could not cast it. But this most exalted of angels, Dominion Authority, could do it by itself. That was why it was ranked among the highest order of all angels. The magic that Nigun ordered to be cast, the seventh tier Holy Smite, was such a mighty spell. I got it, I got it. Hurry up and make your move. I won't do anything. That should satisfy you, right? However, Ainz's relaxed attitude was like a pedestrian letting another person walk past him. 
His casual attitude filled Negun with fear. The Angel of the Highest Order had once defeated the demon gods of legends. Its omnipotent power was enough to qualify it as the mightiest being on the continent. It was invincible. Yet if someone could defeat it, if the mysterious magic caster before him could do it, it would mean that this mysterious person was a far stronger being than a demon god. Such a person could not exist. In response to its summoner's wish to use its most powerful attack, Dominion Authority shattered its scepter. The fragments rose up into the air and slowly orbited its body. I see. So this is a once per summoning special skill that it uses to augment its spell power. It would seem this Dominion is about the same as the one in Yggdrasil. Holy smite. The spell was cast, and a pillar of light broke through the sky. With a loud whoosh, a seemingly endless cascade of holy blue-white radiance flooded down from the heavens, submerging Ainz, who simply raised one arm to shade his eyes. The seventh tier of magic, a height humanity could not hope to attain. This sacred power would annihilate all evil beings, and even good entities would meet the same fate. The difference was only if they were reduced to sightless atoms, or if there would actually be remains left behind. This was the awesome power of magic that exceeded the realm of humanity. No, it would be strange if that were not the case. Yet he was still there. Ein Zul Gon, the monster, was not blasted into glowing ash, sprawled on the ground, or pulverized into meat jelly but he was still standing nonchalantly, and even laughing. <laughs> As expected of magic that has extra effect on those of evil alignment, so this is what taking damage feels like. Pain, is it? I see, I see. Still, even though I feel pain, my mind is clear and my ability to act is not affected at all. The pillar of light vanished. It had no effect. Wonderful. I've concluded another experiment. His voice sounded indifferent. No, it, it would be more accurate to say that he was satisfied. Negan and company thought that way, and the smiles on their faces froze. However, one person was filled with anger. You... You inferior life form! Alberto's shout ripped through the air. You inferior life forms! How... How dared you do such a thing to my beloved master, Lord Ainz? You pieces of shit! How dare you cause pain to the man I love, my master, Lord Ainz? Do not think that I will allow you to die so easily. I will have you taste the greatest suffering this world has to offer until you go mad from agony. I will melt off your limbs with acid, cut off your genitals, and feed them to you as mincemeat. Then I will heal you and do it all again. Ah! I hate you! I hate you! I hate you! I hate you so much that my heart is going to burst! Her arms, clawing at her head and sheathed in black armor, were writhing. It felt like the world was distorting, with her at the center. A wave of world-twisting, courage-sapping malice smashed into them like a hurricane. Something seemed to be crawling under that black armor, like there was an enormous creature that was about to break through the plates and reveal itself. Nigun knew this was happening but there was nothing he could do but stand there and watch the emergence of a monster that would pollute the world. Only one person in this world could rein her in. Ainz raised his hand and quietly said, That's enough, Albedo. Those words were enough to stop Albedo in her tracks. But, but Lord Ainz, these inferior life forms. It's fine, Albedo. Everything has gone according to my predictions, aside from the weakness of the angels. 
What else is there to be angry about? As Alberto heard this, she raised a hand to her breast and bowed in acknowledgement. As expected of Lord Ines, your insight is truly fitting of the title Fathomless. I am in awe. No, no, no. The truth is, I'm quite glad that you would be worried and angry for me. However, your charming smile is far more preferable. <laughs> Ch charming? <coughs> Thank you, Lord Ines. Now then, I'm sorry you had to wait for so long. Nigun, who was stunned by their easy going back and forth, finally managed to recover enough of his senses to shout. I know it! I know your true identities! Demon gods! You must be demon gods! There were scant few intelligent beings that Nigun knew of, which could stand on par with the highest tier angels. The six gods which Nigun believed in, the kings of the mighty draconic races, the dragon lords, the legendary monster who could destroy an entire country, Landfall, and one more, the demon gods. He had heard that the thirteen heroes had defeated and sealed away the demon gods. Judging by that wave of evil from just now, that must have been a demon god about to break its seal. At the same time, Nigun had the faint hope that if they were demon gods, then Dominion Authority might still have a chance to win. One more time! Use Holy Smite! Ein said that the spell had hurt. That meant he had been injured. It might mean that he had trouble just standing up. Countless mites popped up in Nigun's mind. Without them, he would go mad. However, Ainz would not permit a second attack. Now it's my turn. No despair. Black hole! A small point appeared on Dominion Authority's shining body. It slowly enlarged into a yawning black void. The black hole swallowed everything. It was so underwhelming that it made them stare in dumbfounded silence. It might even be laughable, but they could no longer see it. As the radiance of Dominion Authority vanished, the light drained from the surroundings. There was only the sound of the wind blowing across the plains, and then a hoarse cry broke the silence. Who are you people? Nigun asked these impossible beings again. I have never heard the name of a magic caster called Ainzul Gon before. No, there cannot be someone who could destroy the highest ranked angel in one blow. Someone like that should not exist. Nigun shook his head powerlessly. All I know is that you are far beyond a demon god. This is unbelievable. Who exactly are you? Like I said, I am Arns Ul Gon. In the past, there was nobody who did not tremble at this name. Well, I guess we've spent enough time on idle chatter. Going on would be pointless. Also, just so we don't waste each other's time. There is an anti-teleport effect surrounding me, and my subordinates are waiting in ambush. You have nowhere to run. The sun set completely, and darkness swallowed the land. Nigu knew that this was the end. This was an unassailable reality. Just as his subordinates fell into despair one after the other, cracks appeared in the sky, like the breaking of a pot. They vanished in an instant, and the scenery returned to normal. As confusion washed over Nigun, Ainz answered, Good grief. You know, you should thank me. It would seem someone was using divination magic to keep an eye on you. But because I was in the spell's effective range, my anti-scrying offensive barrier activated, and you were not observed. Really, if I had known, I would have linked a higher tier attack spell to it. Those words filled Nigun's eyes with realization. The slain theocracy must have been spying on him. A widened explosion might not be enough to teach them how to behave. Oh well, things being as they are, playtime is over. 
A wave of cold ran through Nigun as he picked up the hidden meaning in those words. He, who had always been the oppressor, was now going to become one of the oppressed. He was filled with an incomparable fear. The fear that he, who had taken countless lives in the past, was now going to have his own life taken. His subordinates saw his terrified expression, and it frightened them as well. He was on the verge of tears. He wanted to kneel down and loudly beg for his life, but Eins did not look like a compassionate man. Thus, Nigun fought back the urge to weep, trying his best to look for a way to survive. But no matter how he thought, he could not think of any way to get help from the outside. Therefore, his only hope was to throw himself on the mercy of Einzul Gon. Wait, wait, wait a bit. Einzul Gon, no, 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 Tama, please, wait, we, no, no, I wish to make a deal with you. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. As long as you spare me, I will give you any amount of money you want. He could see his shocked subordinates out of the corner of his eye, but they were no longer relevant to him. The only thing that mattered now was his own life. Everything else was of secondary importance. Besides, he could find more subordinates, but his own self was irreplaceable. Ignoring the countless angry voices of his men, Nigun continued, it, it, it must be difficult to satisfy the taste of such a, such a great magic caster as yourself, but I will definitely prepare enough money to please you. I have a position of some power in my country, so they will definitely pay any price to ransom me. Uh, of course, if you desire anything else, I will do my best to meet your wishes, so I beg you, please spare my life. Nigun panted as he finished his monologue. What? What about it? Einzul Gonsama. A delicate, gentle woman's voice responded to Nigun's desperate plea. <laughs> Did you not reject the compassionate offer of the Supreme One, Lord Einz? That is... <laughs> I know what you want to say. You wanted to beg for your life because accepting his proposition would also mean your death. Am I correct? The black helmeted head shook as though it was tired of talking. <laughs> you seem to have gotten the wrong idea. Since Lord Eines, who holds the power of life and death in Nazareth, has already stated his will, inferior life forms like you humans should lower your heads and gratefully await the taking of your lives. Alberto's forceful words were backed by an adamant resolve. She's... she's mad. This woman is mad. Negan, who realized this, looked hopefully to Eins. Eins had been quietly listening to them. When he realized that Negan was waiting for his decision, he shook his head in exasperation and said, Indeed, it is as she says. Now then, what was it you said to Gazeth? Cease your pointless struggles and lie down quietly. As a final act of mercy, I will kill you without drawing out your suffering. As he walked along the night-veiled plains, Eins raised his head. What greeted him was the beautiful sight of stars in the sky. Eins sighed at the scenery for the second time, and then he headed back to the village. He had gone a little overboard. As long as Elbedo was by his side, he could not afford to appear useless to her. As her master, he needed to act in a fitting manner in front of his subordinates. While he might have gone a bit too far, it still fit the role he was playing. He did not know if he had passed or failed, but it would be fine as long as Elbedo was not disappointed. Eins could not see Elbedo's expression of... Damn, Lord Eins was so cool. <laughs> muttered under her closed helmet. Since he could not tell what she was thinking, he went over the day's proceedings once more. Still, Lord Eins, why did you save Gazeth? Why indeed? 
Eines could not articulate his feelings at the time, so he tried to approximate them for her. This was a problem we caused, so shouldn't we try to settle it ourselves? Then why did you give him that item? I was laying the foundation for future plans. Letting him hold it would be a good thing for me. Eines had a lot of the Yggdrasil cash items that he had given Gazif. Although he could not replenish his stock of them, giving one away was not a great loss. In addition, Eines was actually happy to have less of those items. That was because those were consolation prizes from the 500 yen gacha draws, which reminded Eines of how profligate he had been with his spending and his poor lifestyle then. In addition, while he had spent countless 500 yen coins on finally getting the ultra-rare item that was the top prize, his former comrade Yamaiko had gotten it on the first try. The impact of that incident cast an indelible shadow in Ainz's heart. He had wanted to throw those consolation prizes away, but when he thought of the 500 yen it had cost, he could not bear to wastefully dispose of it. Well... It doesn't matter who ends up with that item in the end, or if it ends up being used or not. It's no loss to me. Would it not have been best to let me take care of things? There was no need to trouble you to personally aid those inferior life forms. Surrounding them was hardly a difficult task, which is why I submit that you did not need to personally take the field. Is that so? Without a device to measure power levels, that was all Ainz could say in response. In Yggdrasil, one could determine the strength of an enemy by the color of their names. Beyond that, one could only rely on information from one's friends and walkthrough sites. Ainz could not help but feel nostalgic. If only I had learned some information type spells. Ainz thought with a hint of regret. Of course, he did not know if those spells could be used here. However, if he could, then he would not have to be as nervous as he was now. Still, there was no point worrying about what he did not have. Eines decided to think of something else. I know your strength, Albedo, and I trust you. However, I would like you to discard such shallow thinking, and remember that an enemy who is stronger than myself could appear at any time. This is especially true given that we do not quite understand this world. So I hoped Gazeth could do our work for us. I see. So you used him as a pawn to feel out the enemy's strength. <laughs> it is quite fitting to use inferior life forms like humans in that way. Although the closed helm revealed none of her emotions, her freshly flowered joy was obvious in her voice. Eines had been a human in the past. And now, he was undead. Since just now, he had sensed that Albedo hated humans very much. However, it did not upset him or make him feel depressed. Rather, he felt that such thoughts were quite suitable for the inhuman guardian overseer of the great underground tomb of Nazarik. Indeed. However, that is not all. Since we saved him at the brink of death, he will be even more grateful to us. In addition, since the enemy was a special forces unit, the country's higher-ups will not investigate the matter too openly. That was why I stepped in. Ah, as expected of Lord Ainz. So that was why you took the commander and the others alive. Marvelously done. Ainz could not help but feel proud when he heard Albedo's praise. After all, he managed to put together a sensible, coherent plan in a short period of time. Perhaps this was his leadership talent at work. Just then, Alberto's cheerful voice entered Ainz's self-satisfied ears. Still, was it necessary to take the angel's swords with your precious body, Lord Ainz? Is that how it looked to you? When we first came to Khan Village, we used the knights on the outskirts to verify that my high-tier physical nullification was still working normally. Indeed, you are correct. I verified it with my own eyes as well. However, I did not wish my eyes to helplessly watch the swords of those despicable angels piercing your body, Lord Ainz. I see. Though you were my shield, 
I did not take your feelings into consideration. You have mine. And even if I knew you would emerge unscathed, what kind of woman would want to see the man she loves being stabbed by swords? Uh, um, <clears throat> yes. Eines did not know how to answer, so he let it slide as he continued to the village. Alberto did not seem to want to press the matter further and followed quietly. Once they reached the village, the villagers, led by the Death Knight, came out to meet them. They lavished praise and thanks onto them, and Ayn saw Gazef among the villagers. Oh, warrior captain, I'm glad you're all right. I should have gone to your side earlier, but the item I gave you took some time to work, which was why I was almost too late. My apologies. What are you saying? It is I who should be thanking you, Master Gon. After all, you saved me. Speaking of which, where did those fellows go? Since Gazef had changed his tone somewhat, Ainz decided to nonchalantly inspect him. Gazef had taken off his armor and carried no weapons with him. He was bruised all over, and half his face was swollen up, like a strange-looking misshapen ball. Yet, a fire burned within his eyes. Ainz turned away, as though he had seen something brilliant. His eyes reflexively went to the ring Gazef wore on his left finger. Ah, so he was married. Hmm, it's probably good that his wife won't need to shed tears for him. As he thought about that, Ainz decided to carefully put on an act. Oh, I chased them off. I couldn't take care of all of them, as I thought. That was a lie, of course. They had all been shipped back to the great underground tomb of Nazarick. Gazef narrowed his eyes a little, but neither of them spoke. The air between them grew tense. In the end, Gazef broke the silence. Truly amazing! I do not know how I can repay you for your help, Master Gon. Please, look for me when you come to the royal capital. I will welcome you with open arms. Is that so? Hmm. Then... I will have to impose on you when the time comes. Master Gon, I do not know what plans you have, but would you be willing to travel with us? We will be staying in this village for a little while. Is that so? Well, I was planning to move on, though I have not decided my destination yet. It's already so late. Traveling now would be... Gazif cut himself off halfway. Forgive me. There was no need to worry about a mighty being like yourself, Master Gon. Then, please seek me out when you reach the capital. My doors will always be open to you. In addition, I am deeply grateful to you for your gift of a full set of equipment from the knights who attacked the village. Eines nodded and decided that he had taken care of everything he needed to do in the village. There had been more things to do here than he had expected, and he had spent more time here than he had planned. Let's go home, Albedo. Ayn said in a voice low enough that only Albedo could hear. She immediately turned around joyfully in response, although she was still wearing her full plate armor. Ayn's room was filled with exquisite furniture, while the floor was laid with a bright red carpet. The vast room was usually draped in a thin veil of silence, and today... It was even more quiet than normal. The maid who normally attended him here was nowhere to be seen. The only people here were Ainz and his sword-bearing death knight in the corner. Alberto spoke in a soft, syrupy, sweet voice, as though trying to preserve the silence of the room. I have a report to deliver. The commander of the slain theocracy's Sunlight Scripture, who we captured, has been incarcerated in the frozen prison. We will extract information from him with the help of the Special Intelligence Gathering Officer. If it's Neuronist interrogating them, there shouldn't be any problems. However, I want to conduct experiments on their bodies. Do you know anything about this? Understood. In addition, we are currently looking through the arms and armor recovered from the men dressed as knights. They do not bear any major enchantments, and will be sent to the Treasury after the investigations are concluded. Well... That's the proper way to dispose of them. Finally, I 
I plan to have two shadow demons keep an eye on the village. Then, what should we do about Gazef Stronoff? Leave the warrior captain be for now. It is more important that we build a good relationship with that village. We might need their help in the future, so avoid antagonizing them. Understood. I will take care of it. Thus ends the report. Ainz turned to look at Albedo as he said, Well done. The look on her face was slightly different from her usual gentle smile. She seemed particularly happy today. The reason was the sparkling ring of Ainz Ulgon upon her left ring finger, which she caressed lovingly. Although she could wear the ring anywhere she wanted, it was not hard to tell why she was wearing the ring on that finger. If that was how Alberto truly felt, then as a man, Ainz would be overjoyed. However, if that was the result of his tampering, it would make him feel guilty instead. Alberto, the love you feel for me is the result of my meddling. They are certainly not your original feelings. Therefore... What should he do next? Was it right to change her memories with magic? Ainz could not go on. Just then, Alberto looked at Ainz and smiled. Before you changed me, what kind of person was I, Lord Ainz? A slut. Ainz could not say that, of course, but he did not know how to tell her. Though he appeared calm enough on the exterior, his heart was in chaos. Then, Alberto spoke again. Then... I am quite happy with the way I am now, so there is no need for you to feel upset, Lord Ainz. But... But... But what, may I ask? Ainz did not answer, sensing something unusual coming from Albedo. She continued addressing the silent Ainz. There is only one thing that matters. As Ainz waited for Albedo to continue, she said, Does it trouble you? Ainz dumbly opened his mouth, taking note of Alberto's smiling face. Her words branded themselves deeply into his brain, although his skull was empty. But Ainz knew what she was trying to say, and hastily replied, No, no, how could it inconvenience me? He was not at all unhappy with receiving the love of a beauty like Alberto. Well, at least for now. Then, is there a problem with it? Uh... It felt wrong. He thought that, but Ainz could not find any reason to refute her. Then it should be fine, right? Alberto said again. Ainz could sense something mysterious and inscrutable in those words, and he brought up a question in a final, desperate attempt to struggle free. I messed with Tabula's character settings. Don't you wish to go back to your old self? I believe Lord Tabula would approve. <laughs> with all the joy of giving his daughter away from marriage. Is... is that so? Was he really like that? Just as Ainz was thinking about this, the sound of clashing metal rang out. He turned to look at the source of the sound, and saw a longsword on the ground. The Death Knight who should have been holding that sword was nowhere to be seen. He had summoned the missing Death Knight not long ago. When I summon them normally, they disappear after a while. Hmm. Given the way the sword from this world is on the ground, it would seem that equipment alone was not enough to bind them to this world, so it was left behind. If that is the case, does that Death Knight remain here because I used a corpse to summon it? It would appear that I can strengthen Nazarik if I had more corpses. Then shall we collect a large amount of corpses for you? Try to avoid digging up that village's graveyard. Understood. However, we must then consider a way to procure fresh corpses. Now that the Death Knight has disappeared, everyone should have assembled by now. Please proceed to the throne room with Sebas. I will go ahead first. I see. Very well, Albedo. I'll see you later. As Albedo quietly left Ainz's room, she saw Sebus approaching along the corridor. Sebus, you've come just in time. Albedo, is Lord Momonga in his room? Yes, he is. 
Alberto could not help but feel superior as she heard Sebis still referring to Ainz as Momonga. As he saw the look on her face, Sebis raised an eyebrow. You seem to be in a good mood. Did something good happen? <laughs> yes. Alberto's joy was not just because of the name, but because she recalled her conversation with Ainz. She spoke of marrying Ainz, and he did not reject or deny the suggestion. In other words... Albedo's smile shifted, going from graceful and elegant to lewd and wicked in an instant. It was a smile she would never show to Ainz. <laughs> I've done it! No, I will definitely do it. I will be the one seated beside him. Shaltier will be nothing more than my footrest. Albedo clenched her fist, unable to resist the words boiling up in her heart. These were not words of a guardian overseer, but a woman. Ah, my succubus blood is boiling. Sabbath silently watched Albedo as she acted up. The throne room. Sebus trailed behind Ainz as he entered the room, fashionably late. There were many people kneeling here to show their loyalty. Nobody in this place moved a muscle, and it was so quiet that even the sound of their breathing could be heard. Apart from that, there was only the sound of Ainz and Sebus's footsteps, as well as the tapping of the staff of Ainzul Gon on the ground. Ainz ascended the stairs and sat on the throne. Sebus remained at the foot of the throne, kneeling behind Alberto. Ainz silently surveyed the throne room from where he was seated. Almost all of the guild's NPCs were gathered below him. They looked quite majestic when he watched them from on high like a night parade of monsters. Ainz could not help but silently praise his guild members for their creativity in making so many different and interesting characters. As he looked again, there were several NPCs who were not present. However, that couldn't be helped. After all, they could not easily move the ultra-large golem Gargantua and Victim, who oversaw the eighth floor, from their positions. However, it was not just NPCs who were gathered here. Although they were not intended to replace the above-mentioned two people, this great hall also contained many high-leveled vassals who had been hand-picked by the other floor guardians. That said, the throne room did not feel crowded at all, given its massive size. Although he could understand why his underlings would not want to let their servants into the heart of the great underground tomb of Nazarik, the throne room, Ainz felt that such severity was not needed. Ah, forget it. Not like it's important anyway. After deciding to discuss those matters later, Ainz slowly addressed his subordinates. Firstly, I would like to apologize for taking independent action. Ainz was feeling singularly unapologetic as he said those words. It was mere pleasantry, yet the apology was extremely important. Since gathering them all was his idea, then he needed to let his subordinates know that he trusted them implicitly. Albedo will tell you why I have gathered you all here afterwards. However, there is a matter which is more important than that. I must tell the gathered members of the great underground tomb of Nazarik something. Greater break item. Ainz cast a spell which could destroy a magic item of a certain level. A large flag fell from one of the poles attached to the ceiling. The sigil on the flag represented Momonga. I have changed my name. From now on, my name is... Ainz pointed to a certain place, and everyone's eyes followed his finger. Ainz will go. You may address me as Ainz. Momonga was pointing to the flag which hung behind the throne imprinted with the icon of Ainz Wul Gon. Momonga raised his staff and forcefully slammed its tip into the ground to get everybody's attention. If anyone objects to this, rise now and let your views be heard. Nobody spoke out in opposition. Albedo was all smiles as she replied. We have all heard your glorious name. All hail Ainz Wul Gon. O Supreme One, Lord Ainz Wul Gon. Every member of the great underground tomb of Nazarick pledges their undying loyalty to you. Long live Ainzul Gaon, 
O King of fearsome power, I and Zul Gal, all shall know your greatness. Shortly after, the floor guardians shouted as one. Long live I Zul Gal, O King of fearsome power, I and Zul Gal, all shall know your greatness. The shouts of praise of the NPCs and servants thundered through the throne room. As he basked in the praise of his subordinates, Ainz thought, My friends, what do you think of me using this great name? Are you happy? Are you displeased? If you have any objections, please let me know. Tell me that this is not a name you can take for yourself. I will gladly return my old name of Mamonga. Now then. Ainz looked out at everyone. Next. I shall announce our new direction. This is an absolute order. Eines paused here and looked around. The subordinates before him had serious, stern looks on their faces. Make Eines Ul Gon an eternal legend! He gripped the staff of Eines Ul Gon tightly and wrapped it on the ground. Then, as though responding to Eines, the crystals socketed on the staff of Ein Zul Gon radiated light in all the colors of the rainbow, and the air around him trembled. There may be many heroes, but we will surpass each and every one of them. We will let everyone in this world know that those of Ein Zul Gon are the true heroes. If there are beings stronger than us, we will deal with them in ways other than force. If we encounter a magic caster with many subordinates, we will achieve our goal some other way. This is merely the preparatory phase in order to let everyone know that Ein Zul Gon is the greatest. Let us fight together for this glorious future! He would spread this name throughout the world. The former members of Ein Zul Gon may have left Yggdrasil, but there was a chance they might be in this world, like Ainz. Therefore, he had to make Ainz Ulgon a legend, so everyone would know of it. Be it in the air, land, or sea, he would spread this name to all the sapient beings in this world. He would carry this name to the ears of his comrades who might be in this world. Ainz's fearsome presence was startling, and his thunderous voice could be heard anywhere in the throne room. Their voices united as one, Everyone in the throne room lowered their heads. The sound they made might have been taken for a prayer. The throne was vacant after its master left, but the air in the throne room still boiled with excitement. Hearing their supreme overlord's orders to work as one filled everybody with incomparable motivation especially those who had been given specific orders. Everyone, raise your heads. After hearing Albedo's calm and steady voice, the people whose heads were still lowered lifted their heads in unison. Everyone, please act as Lord Ein's orders. After that, I have something to announce. Albedo's eyes were fixed on the flag of Ein's Ulgon that hung behind the throne. The NPCs and servants behind her were also looking at it. Demiurge, tell everyone what Lord Ein said to you. Understood. Demiurge was kneeling with everyone else. However, his voice could clearly be heard by everyone present. Lord Ein looked to the night sky and told me, Perhaps the reason that I have come here is to claim this chest of jewels, which belongs to nobody. After that, he said, No, this is not something I can claim for myself. Perhaps these jewels are meant to adorn the great underground tomb of Nazarick. Demiurge smiled, but it was filled with something other than kindness. Finally, Lord Ein said, However, conquering this world might be quite interesting. In short, that means... The look in everyone's eyes turned razor sharp. It represented their iron will and determination. Albedo rose slowly to look on everyone's faces. Everyone looked at Albedo, as if in response. At the same time, they looked at the flag of Ein's Ulgon behind her. Understanding Lord Ein's true intentions and preparing for them is the proof of our loyalty 
and the mark of excellent subordinates. Everyone must keep in mind that the final objective of the great underground tomb of Nazareth is to deliver this chest of jewels, the world, to Lord Ives. Albetta was all smiles, and she turned that smile to the flag behind her. Lord Ives, we will definitely give this world to you. Then, countless voices spoke as one, their words echoing across the throne room. We will render everything in this world unto its rightful ruler, Lord Ives.